Hi, I'm uh, Paul Soplin. I'm an agent with the uh, State Crime Bureau of Minnesota. And Randy, we investigate crimes all over. Carrie Nelson worked at a state park where she ran a contact station. She was usually accompanied by co-workers in the office, but one day she found herself alone for half an hour. During that time, a horrific event occurred. In first case, we will discuss the tragic end of this young woman and how the perpetrator was identified years later. We will also witness the investigation of murders that occurred one year apart in Oxnard, California and how the perpetrator was caught 40 years later. Brace yourselves, we're stepping into the crime scene now. <music> Carrie Nelson was born on December 13, 1980 to Peter and Stan Nelson. She was known and loved by many for her hardworking nature, kindness, and remarkable empathy. After graduating from Laverne High School in Minnesota in 1999, she gained admission to a university in South Dakota. Over the course of two summers, she took up part-time work at Blue Mound State Park in Minnesota. The Blue Mound State Park boasted a range of facilities including a campground, climbing sites, an interpretive center, a park residence, and a contact station. Carrie worked at the contact station. Her job involved welcoming visitors and supplying them with vehicles and equipment. She enjoyed the social aspects of her job and meeting people from diverse ethnic backgrounds. However, whenever she worked with her coworker, Stephen, she felt uneasy and worried. Carrie, Stephen's presence making her distinctly uncomfortable implored her friends never to leave her alone with him. She was aware of his illegal substance use, which caused erratic behavior. She even considered reporting him to the police. Carrie was engaged to Mike Kellen, and they were planning a happy life together. On May 20, 2001, Carrie was working the 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. shift. That day, the only other employee working alongside her was Rebecca White. It was only Rebecca's second day in her new role as the host at the Interpretive Center. She spent the entire day receiving extensive, job-related guidance and information from Carrie. Rebecca's father, Richard, served as the manager of Blue Mound State Park, and their family's home was located within the park's premises. At 1 p.m., Rebecca departed from the contact station, leaving Carrie by herself. After completing her duties in the park, she returned home through heavy rain, changed her clothes, and came back to the station around 2.30 p.m. through the back door. Rebecca discovered Carrie lying motionless and bleeding from her ear, a clear sign she had been attacked. In a panic, Rebecca decided to flee. As she was leaving, she heard someone entering through the front door but didn't want to confront the assailant, so she ran home. She urgently reported the dire situation at the station to her family, including the chilling detail of hearing the potential assailant's voice. Her mother immediately called 911. Richard and Rebecca hurried to the contact station and checked Carrie's pulse. They sadly realized that she had passed it away. Richard called 911 and then locked the front door, turning the open sign to closed. At that moment, a park visitor entered the station seeking information. Upon seeing Carrie lying motionless behind the counter, he, much like Richard and Rebecca earlier, was overtaken by panic and hastily left to call 911. Three calls were made to the police that day. The first call was from Rebecca's mother, Rhonda, the second from Richard, and the third from a park visitor who had seen Carrie. Around 3.30 p.m., unaware of what had transpired, Carrie's fiancé, Mike, attempted to call her, knowing she would have finished work by that time. However, Carrie did not answer her cell phone, and when Mike tried calling the office phone, he received no response there either. Oblivious to the grim reality, Mike didn't realize that Carrie had tragically fallen victim to a brutal murder. 
Upon their arrival, the police quickly initiated their investigation, soon uncovering the theft of two bank bags and $2,000 from the contact station safe. Evidence of a struggle was apparent inside the station, with papers scattered in the back area, a fax machine cord hanging from the wall, and bloodstains on the floor, ceiling, and counters. Additionally, a broken chair arm was discovered, and a carved rock piece, possibly the murder weapon, was found near Carrie's lifeless body. Once merely a decorative item in the office, the rock now ominously stood incomplete, a crucial part of it eerily missing. At the crime scene, investigators found a cigarette packet and a broken wristwatch near Carrie's body. They spoke to everyone in the park, asking if they had seen Carrie on the morning of the murder. A camping couple reported seeing her at the contact station around 1.30 p.m., and another camper mentioned seeing Carrie working inside the station at 2 p.m. The police found a letter that Carrie had written to her boyfriend in the office. The letter, dated and timed at 2.20 p.m., guided the police to estimate the murder to have occurred approximately at 2.30 p.m. The autopsy grimly disclosed that Carrie's death resulted from multiple forceful blows to her head. She was struck at least five times with severe force, and the pathologist suggested there might have been even more blows. The suspected murder weapon, a carved rock piece, was later found in a nearby creek. The police collected all DNA samples from the office. Carrie's DNA matched all bloodstains. A mixture of five different DNAs was obtained from the broken wristwatch found near her body. Initially, Stephen, her problematic co-worker, was suspected, but no evidence linking him to the crime was found. DNA tests from the watch did not match Stephen's, proving his innocence. The DNA samples from the watch were entered into databases, but no matches were found, leading the case to go cold. In 2007, DNA techniques and technology advancements prompted a reanalysis of the watch's DNA. With the aid of advanced techniques, cleaner and more definitive DNA mixtures were extracted and meticulously cataloged in the databases. Requests for assistance were sent to neighboring states, hoping for a breakthrough after years. A possible match was found in South Dakota, Randy Lee Royal Swanee, who was an inmate at the time. The police had recently taken his DNA sample. After further investigation, it was suggested that the DNA of Randy's wife, Dawn Sweeney, might also be present in the mixtures found on the watch. Notably, Randy had never been mentioned in the investigation before and was not in the park on the day of the incident. As there was no known connection between Randy and Carrie, stronger evidence was required. In a crucial discovery, the police found Randy's fingerprints and palm prints to perfectly match the latent prints uncovered in the contact station. Brochures from the Blue Mound Writer series, which were scattered on the floor near Carrie's body, contained prints from both of Randy's hands. The police interrogated Don Sweeney about her whereabouts on the day of Carrie's murder after contacting her. She claimed to have been at work, but was further questioned. Don agreed to assist the investigation and led the police to a storage unit they had rented. The police found family photos that proved crucial. In these photos, Randy was wearing a watch identical to the broken one found near Carrie's body. After the police left the storage unit, Don called Randy in prison and asked if he was involved in Carrie's murder. Eavesdropping with intent, the police overheard every word of the revealing conversation. Randy denied any involvement and claimed he had never been to the park mentioned. In 2007, Randy was indicted by a grand jury on seven counts of murder. The charges included three counts of first-degree murder and four counts of second-degree murder. Despite Randy's claims of innocence, the prosecution's case was clear. Randy had murdered Carrie during a robbery. Upon entering the station that day, under the belief it was empty, Randy schemed to swiftly steal the visible cash and escape unnoticed. At one point, he came across Carrie, likely hitting her nose, and then dragged her to the back room where he forced her to open the safe. He took the money and repeatedly hit Carrie's head with a carved rock to prevent her from identifying him. 
The prosecution presented DNA evidence and called witnesses who were camping in the area that day. A park employee testified that the flyers found in the office, which bore Randy's fingerprints, were displayed just four days before Carrie's murder. During the trial, Randy's family members testified that he smoked the same brand of cigarettes found at the crime scene and usually wore a wristwatch. Additionally, two inmates provided testimony. One inmate asserted that Randy had been to Blue Mound State Park, inadvertently leaving his watch in Carrie's office. The other inmate alleged that Randy had confessed, saying, they got me this time. The defense argued that Randy did not murder Carrie and was not in the park that day. In his testimony, Randy claimed that he had spent the day fishing in Vermilion, South Dakota at the time of the murder. Randy initially denied ever visiting the park, but subsequently altered his statement, conceding that he might have visited previously for information. The prosecution challenged this by asking how his prints could be on flyers printed just four days before the murder if he had never been there. Randy could not explain this. The defense contended that the inmate witnesses were fabricating their testimonies, highlighting that one was notoriously known as an unreliable jailhouse informant. Additionally, they suggested that Anthony Flowers could be responsible. Flowers had escaped from a South Dakota prison and had been at large for a month. According to another inmate, Flowers confessed to killing Carrie and being with another woman afterward. The prosecution quickly dismissed this theory, viewing it as a calculated maneuver by Flowers to orchestrate a transfer to another facility. Following six hours of intense deliberation, the jury reached their verdict, convicting Randy on three counts of first-degree murder and four counts of second-degree murder. Randy Sweeney was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Before we dive into our next story, if you could take a moment to hit that like button, it would mean the world to us. A single click for you is a huge boost of encouragement for us. We are going to Oxnard, a city in California, USA. Rachel Zendayas was born on November 20th, 1960. At a young age, Rachel embarked on a challenging journey of motherhood with the birth of her two daughters, Eva and Monica. Eva was born in 1978 and Monica in 1980. However, Rachel's relationship with her husband was strained and she decided to leave him after Monica's birth. Rachel had to work hard to support her children. Rather than accepting low-level positions, Rachel aimed to earn a degree and enrolled at Oxnard College in California. Facing life's challenges, Rachel moved in with her brother, balancing a part-time job and her studies, embodying the roles of both a working mother and a student. Juggling work, studies, and motherhood, Rachel navigated a tightrope of responsibilities, each aspect demanding its unique sacrifice and resilience. She struggled to balance her responsibilities and eventually hired a babysitter to care for her children. Rachel persevered through her struggles until a tragic turn of events on January 18, 1981. Two newspaper deliverers found Rachel's naked body in a garage near her brother's house that morning. They immediately called 911 and the police arrived at the scene. Rachel had bruises on her body. The autopsy revealed that she had been raped and strangled to death. Determined to bring justice, the police launched an intensive investigation to track down the killer. Combing through the neighborhood, the police diligently sought anyone who might have witnessed any unusual activities the night prior. They questioned Rachel's brother, neighbors, and local residents, and collected evidence from the scene. DNA evidence and fingerprints were discovered on Rachel's body, but the technology of the time was insufficient for identifying the perpetrator. Despite the era's technological limitations, which confined comparisons to known suspects, the police tirelessly sought leads. The police obtained many clues, but they found nothing despite their searches, and the case went cold. About a year later, another woman named Lisa Gondek tragically lost her life in Oxnard. Lisa was born in 1960 and spent her childhood in Connecticut. 
At the age of 21, she moved to Oxnard, California, in search of a job to support herself. Upon moving to Oxnard for new opportunities, Lisa shared a residence with a childhood friend. After working at a youth clothing store in the Esplanade Shopping Center in Oxnard for about a year, she met a tragic end. On December 12, 1981, firefighters responded to a 911 call reporting a fire in an apartment. In a prompt response, the firefighters arrived at the scene to confront the unfolding tragedy. Upon arrival, the firefighters discovered a naked woman's body in the apartment's bathroom. They immediately informed the police, who arrived and identified the victim as 21-year-old Lisa Gondek. An autopsy revealed that she had been raped and showed signs of strangulation. Neighbors reported hearing screams, but did not call 911. The Oxnard police noticed that the murders of Rachel and Lisa were strikingly similar. Faced with mounting public pressure, the police grappled with the complex challenge of solving these intricate cases. Despite thorough investigations, the police announced that they had not identified any viable suspects and had no further leads. 23 years after the murders of Lisa and Rachel, advancements in DNA technology began to shed light on unsolved cases. The entry of DNA samples into national databases marked a crucial turning point, heightening the possibility of solving these long-standing mysteries. Detectives re-examined both cases and noticed striking similarities. Rachel and Lisa's lifeless bodies bore similar marks and both had been strangled. Additionally, both victims had visited a bar named Huntington's a few hours before their deaths. The bar was situated in the city center, opposite the Esplanade Shopping Center. After an exhaustive analysis and comparison of DNA samples, the detectives arrived at the chilling conclusion that a single individual was responsible for both crimes. They searched national databases, but once again, found no results. There is no information available about the suspect, and the case has been put on hold. In 2019, detectives collaborated with genetic genealogists to trace the suspect's family tree through public DNA profiles. This led them to focus on Tony Garcia, whose DNA matched the evidence found at the 1981 crime scenes. Now a 68-year-old man, Garcia had moved to Oxnard and begun a career as a karate instructor. During their extensive investigation, detectives discovered that Tony was a regular at Huntington's Bar, especially around the time of the murders. They also learned that he had taken up carpentry in Oxnard after the murders. Astonishingly, they discovered that Tony had never left Oxnard, managing somehow to remain unnoticed. Despite identifying Tony as the perpetrator in 2019, a web of logistical and legal challenges hindered his immediate apprehension. He managed to evade capture for another four years, until Ventura police finally apprehended him in February 2023. Tony faced multiple charges, including murder, kidnapping, and rape, with his bail set at $2 million. He is currently detained, awaiting trial, and the death penalty remains a possible outcome. Before we conclude this video, please be aware that the video on the left may be disturbing. It is recommended for adult viewing only. On the right, you'll find a playlist of videos that have been highly appreciated by our viewers.